What's up, Coach? Hey, man, you are right on time today. <laughs> I know. Frankly, frankly, we're always on time because we can just kind of do whatever we want and do this whenever we want to. But you are very punctual and right on time. And uh, hey, welcome. Today is Thursday, the beginning of March Madness, oh, March boy. 21st. We won't dive too deep into it today because this is not the basketball podcast. This is the Crushing Iron Triathlon podcast, episode 252, coming to you every Monday and Thursday, as we have for the last two and a half years. And we thank you for joining us. Yeah, coming to you live from Nashville and Wisconsin. Yeah, this is your last day in Wisconsin, right? Uh, Pretty close, yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, <laughs> Mike's, Mike's in Wisconsin doing uh, some Ironman Wisconsin canceled swim uh, recon for the fact that we all know that the lake's not going to be unfrozen by the time this race is supposed to go off. So, um, Can you imagine? So, I did hear uh, that uh, if it does thaw, they are thinking about going back to the mass start. And non-wetsuit legal. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I can feel the transfer requests coming in like <laughs> the inbox is blowing up uh like crazy. I think Ryan Richards, I think is the name of the RD over there. But yeah. Oh man. Um, we might want to yeah. get him on here to confirm all this. This is true. And actually we should get him on. I've got we've got his email. We've been touching them before, so let's uh let's you know, might as well have him on and he can talk about Wisconsin and um, give some good insider tips to all the people that are doing it this year. But uh, it is. Today's March Madness. Have you made out your bracket? I have, and I was going to wait till the first four games are over. Yeah, because those matter. Well, they matter. For Belmont, they are t- I'm actually really happy they won. Yeah, I'm not sure they should have gotten in the tournament in the first place. But, well, um, you know, they only got in because they're coach. Lipscomb should have got in. But that's just me being a homer. Oh, um, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm with. I think they should have got in too, man. Yeah, they did. They just, but they choked in their conference championship game. Um, I, they did. It was a home game. That's the only part I really. Yeah, you don't feel. get much forgiveness on that one. But uh, I've got mine. I picked. I tried not to go homer the whole way with the Tennessee Vols, um, and I didn't. Uh, I tried to be super objective, but I, I think I have a good one. As usual, I did mine in about three minutes. That's the way uh, to do went, it, man. Yeah, I went in with gut instincts, uh, and I only made one. I'm just, I'll be honest, man. I, I just, I don't see the value and I don't see how you get excited about making more than one bracket. Uh, I just don't, you know, make one, stick with your guns and go with it. You got to you know, do it that th- way. Th- Come that's on. one, you know, you can't like create three and four. But, oh yeah. But this one bracket. Yeah. Congratulations for just choosing random things and getting credit for it. Like, give me a break, make one bracket and own it. Yeah. And that's how you should approach March Madness. Yeah. You don't get to take the same test four times or 80 see, times or whatever. I mean, I think we all could randomly probably have a success story if we did that. For sure. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, and I, I took and I, 80 tests, and I got one of them. <laughs> I got a right. C. Yeah, and uh, I look forward to losing to my wife again this year for like the fourth year in a row. So uh, she goes through and picks hers and obviously doesn't watch or know anything much about college basketball and just picks on teams she's heard of or knows somebody that goes to, and she – I think I think except for one year ends up just owning me, yeah. Because uh, she because t- she you know because it's it's just so random. Uh, a lot of the stuff there's so many upsets and stuff. So, uh, it, but it's still it's exciting. It's fun to watch, and uh, I know a lot of athletes are excited because they got colleges in the tournament, and it makes for good trainer time. Not gonna lie, this is this is probably my second favorite time of the year to ride the trainer. Uh, you got March Madness basically Thursday through Sunday. Uh, this week and then next week and then obviously Tour de France is the other favorite time to ride the trainer. But mm, I think it's a good time to put out our things. eight hour trainer challenge. It is <laughs> <laughs> start Thursday morning and, yes, and just seriously ride it all day. Oh no, thanks. I I, I want no part of that. Um, with four but, yeah. TVs going at the same time, it's, it's exciting. Uh, it's one of my favorite times of the year. The sun is out. We got an extra hour. People are getting outside people seem to just be in better moods in general right now i think everybody kind of 
I think everybody has a tough time, and February is, I think, the worst month because it's it's you've been in the the darkness and the cold for the longest period of time, and then now you're starting. Even in you know up in Wisconsin, obviously the lake's still frozen, but at least the sun's out, and you get more sunshine and a little more vitamin D. I think that actually does uh, just a lot of wonder for people and their moods and and their attitudes and their motivation, and uh, and it is it's we're three weeks out from from big races and four weeks out four four, four and a half weeks out from Boston, and then other their big races in Ironman Texas in April and then we are all in on I mean it's it's jam packed and we're here uh and that's kind of what I was gearing towards in terms of topics today in terms of how what the difference should look like between your your build or your preparatory phases in terms of your big races for the year and then what more a race specific phase might look like for specific athletes and I thought we could touch on that today it doesn't need to be the whole conversation obviously no, I think that's a great one. I would like to say, you know, speak for yourself a little bit on that sunshine and uh, warm weather because it's a little nippy up here still. But not bad. You're right. But the, Who the, cares if the sun is out? Well, I really yeah, care. Yeah, if the no, sun's I agree. out, I'm happy. I'm just saying that, as, as you know, um, I did, I'm up here to do a video project that I do every year for the local hospital. So what that means is that I spend about four days around, three or three days around a local hospital. And you can imagine what that's like. <laughs> I mean, it is nonstop, uh, you know, people going through tough times. You know, I'm carrying lug and gear around past people coming into the building with walkers and wheelchairs and all this kind of stuff. And it's really got me reflecting on how lucky we are, not only just to be able to do this sport, but that I think a lot of us, in this in triathlon have a mentality that doesn't give in you know that that keeps pushing on and we understand that movement and you know eating right and hydration all these sorts of things like actually play a huge role in how you feel and it's a weird thing to say that because this is sort of preaching to the choir but i just wanted to bring it up because it can easily be forgotten you know if you're sick or something like that or whatever but um, it, how important it is just to keep moving and and people forget that or people don't know this stuff man and it's weird to me that people don't understand that that movement and exercise actually leads to a way better quality of life well i i, I do I, I totally agree with you on that obviously but you know my wife and i had this conversation this last weekend, I think, um, about somebody we know, and and she was just like, it's just crazy that that this person this doesn't believe they can get a lot faster, um, and then they're not as fast as they really are. Like they've just accepted, because I mean, listen, like uh, life is all about the story we tell ourselves, and our and, and that story comes and is written over years and years and years and years with input by different people, our parents, our siblings, our friends, our experiences. And that's the, that's the story we end up telling ourselves. And, and while other people might see a different story, how we react and, and how we live and our attitude and the way we approach things is based on our experience and our story. And I think that's molded over time. And, and I think a lot of athletes – that even like i'll be honest with you like do i enjoy working with athletes you know at a high level yes i work with some athletes at at the highest level um of of racing and i love that and it's a different kind of joy and it's a different kind of excitement it's a different kind of return but i'll tell you this is that as a coach one of the most rewarding and most fun parts of my job that is that just enriches me as a coach and as a and as a human is watching these athletes transform mentally and emotionally from I've told my story this self or I've told this story to myself for so long that I just believed it and I became this story. And through triathlon and through racing and through training I've discovered that that was just a total lie. Yeah, that's and beautiful. in 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 that they they have these races and they compete and and they they do these things and, and they're emotional about it and they like chip away at and basically, basically it's they they take their the, the story that they've written or, or that that they that, that they've accepted and when when what happens is when they start to race and they start to find themselves and they start to train they try to then they start to un, uncover 
these different attributes about themselves they never thought existed, it's like they open up that book and just start ripping out pages and ripping out chapters and ripping out huge sections to finally they get – they do it for so long and they accomplish so many things and they uncover so many wonderful things about themselves that they basically are only left with a few core chapters that we're all kind of left with. Yeah. And then it, and then it's at that point they can start to write their own mm-hmm. by themselves without other input, without other, you know, trauma or experiences or, or low self-esteem or low confidence or what they were said to believe in. And I think people just tend to accept that. Uh, I think we accept things as humans a little too easily because – not that people like to accept negative connotations or, or negative thought processes about themselves and how it how it can affect the rest of your life. But, but challenging those beliefs and challenging those thoughts is hard because one of the most difficult – Aspects and, and people talk. People go through this in recovery, especially is is they they might get sober, but then they just accept that they're going to be X, Y, and Z. They're going to be this this person who is you know going to be a miserable human being because they can never have a really good life, and mm-hmm. they accept that and they become that. And because that's the story that you you see on TV or you see you know, like and it's like no, that's not how it is. But they accept that, so they become it. And I think because challenging that puts at risk just accepting the norm which is at least i can put myself in this category and not assume any risk of challenging it and then maybe figuring out that i'm right or i'm wrong and i think as athletes and as individuals we tend to go that direction sometimes too and just accepting that we can't and then you just become that and i think that's one of the greatest challenges that we have as as people and as athletes and as as friends is just to stop accepting the story we tell about ourselves and understand that we can write our own, no matter if you're 18, 20, 25, 40, 60, 75, like it's never too late, you know, because after we're gone, it's what people are going to read. It's not, they're, they're not going to go back and like, you know what? I, you know, he was a pretty good man, but let me go back and read the book that he had when he was finished when he was 28. Like mm-hmm. nobody does that, right. you know? And so just, just take that approach as an athlete and start to, you know, challenge yourself and to, un, to, to discover things and, Again, as a coach, like those are the things that make my job the greatest. Is that yeah, bad? It's like I, n- I never knew I was capable of this. I always thought this, and so when when you see you're able to help, you know, change and affect thought patterns, you know that that just splinters and and webs across the rest of their life. It just like it does when you the athletes I work with on on a very elite level. It's you know I never knew I could could do this at this level and still be happy. Or like I still like you know, and, and still feel good, you know, and, and not feel all this pressure. Mm-hmm. And so again, it's it's just the mental and emotional um, things that that we that we deal with, but that we often easily accept. And I think your experience in the hospital too is is such a good reminder. I think for everyone, I hate going to hospitals. I don't know anybody that likes them, but uh, I know you all. We I've known you for you know six years now, and you always had this gig. You always come back with the same thought, and you're like, man, I'm just like. I'm just glad that's not me, you know, like you just have a whole new appreciation for what you do. And then even I think a more appreciation for, I don't want to ever not be able to do this or have this. Yeah. Part of it is I do, it, it really kind of the first day, it really kind of brings me down in the second. And then it sort of like flips a switch as like, it's that remind that in a way, I think it's a reminder that is good for me. Because, you know, sometimes you got to see what's going on and to remind you. Because, like, when you get into the sport and and a lot of people, they're always asking me. Of course, you know, everyone that's listening to this podcast probably gets this question all the time. It's like, why do you do that, man? It looks miserable. There's, like, this and that. Or why do you, you know, Iron Man. What is, I don't know. But I know that it's going the right way. And I know that I really, I have to do it. Because it's sort of that kind of what you're talking about as far as you got to just keep pushing to turn a new page and turn that new chapter because you just don't know what's going to happen and especially and this is why we talk about how to feel good and how to be happy and healthy in this sport so much is because I think that the actual sport itself is just sort of this thing that that helps us figure out other things and if you're miserable or if you're struggling with training and, and you're tired all the time, and you're not doing it the right way, that can make things worse. Because, you know, as you said, as you, when you go through recovery, you quit drinking, 
and you're going to feel better immediately. But the reality is you're still not dealing with what's deep. You're not dealing with the problems that got you into that situation. So I think that in some ways the movement we do and the, and the breathing and the sunshine and the, just the, the forcing ourselves into uncomfortable situations all the time, just is breaking up stuff and breaking up the rocks in our body and helping us sort through to write that new chapter, to, to tell that story, that different story to yourself all the time, because you can, I mean, that's the thing about these people at the hospital. I, I kind of talk to some of them and sometimes I know people that are up there and they're my age and the, it's really difficult to be nice or, you know, or kind of, I want to, you know, I'm always, you know, we just talk or whatever, but then the stories they tell about, yeah, you know, I got these problems. That shit didn't happen like last week. It happened like six or 10, 50 years ago or 20 mm-hmm. years ago or whatever. It's been, you didn't like just get sick. You've been training your, or you've been getting sick to a point where something had to give. You know, so there's always that. There's always that gray area that I look at. I feel like so many things are overcomable if you just kind of shift your thought patterns, your habits, your perspective, and get in a new groove, man. Well, everything is, I mean, I think even to an extent, like, we're obsessed with with just comfortability. Even if it, even if, or honestly, to some people, like uncomfortable has become comfortable for a lot of people, and mm-hmm. I think that when they when they approach things, when they challenge things, like I read this really awesome quote a couple, maybe I think four or five days ago from a lady, and it said, "the and this is the same thing that you can go for training and taking on new new things in your life, or accepting new challenges, or or trying to rewrite the story you tell yourself, or a new job." And it says, "the price of that new life you want is your current comfortable life." growth is uncomfortable Mm -hmm. and i just think that's such a great uh, you know little mini lesson that you could apply you could apply to every single aspect of your life yeah you know like we're we're comfortable but is that comfortable genuine you know genuine like no stress because i think everyone's definition of of comfortable is different and i think as we as we you know, stretch our, our stretch our li- try to stretch our limits and our abilities of, of physical, you know, and emotional performance. You know, I think some athletes get caught in that I can only do this, or I can I'll never be able to run this time of a marathon. I'll never be able to complete an Ironman. I'll never be able to run the whole thing. I'll never be able to be a good hill climber. I'll never be able to do this. And we, we, it's like we come up with these stories and then we're like, okay, well, why have you ever believed that? I don't know. I just, I just think that. And you're like, wait a minute. Like nothing has ever happened and you've never like tried to go up a hill and you've fallen over. <laughs> and that, you know, in turn made you feel like you weren't a good hill climber. You know, it's just like we just come up with these. And so it, it becomes, you know, our own story is comfortable because we know how, we know how it ends every day because we've done it every single day and we've lived it every single day and we've trained it every single day. So when you start to challenge that, it's not just, you lose the the comfortability and your comfort. You're just leave. You're leaving the comfort of your day to day end of story that you already know. You know, it's like watching the same movie over and over again. You know how it ends, so it's comfortable. You don't have to get suspenseful. You don't get invested. You know, you don't, there's nothing to lose. You just kind of. But then, you know, you go through like the the March Madness version of like everything is everything is now and everything is changing and it's going to change every day, every second and, and emotions are going to go up and down. And it's hard. You know, it's hard to manage those new emotions or finding things out that are new or for a lot of people it's discovering that the last three or four years they've just been, they've been living something that they aren't or that they've settled or that their version of comfortable has really just been complacency, you know, combined with this, you know, misplaced and now unproven identity that they've accepted. Mm-hmm. And when we start to stretch stretch ourselves mentally and emotionally and physically, which you do in these endurance sports and these endurance endeavors, when you find yourself alone, you know, at these races and you make decisions that you look in your day to day life that you would have never made, or that you would have stopped, that you would have quit, that you have never put yourself out there like this. Like you start to learn things about yourself, and then you start to explore even further. Hey, uh, well, maybe this isn't true either. You know, when you start like when, once you uncover one, it's easier to start looking for and being more aggressive 
and proactive in uncovering others. And and again, I think that's just one of the greatest. That that's why I, I we always I think we talked about it maybe last podcast or two podcasts ago and talked about that you know that that training in racing should be just a journey of self exploration and what you're actually co- capable of not obsessing about a pace and not judging it based on that but just finding out what's true or what's not and, or or maybe what's true each day is actually different and in going by that and listening to that and i think when it comes to racing and training i think so oftentimes we we fall into that comfortability of, of not being afraid to test the boundaries of who we've accepted that we are that we can't get any better or not on the flip side, we won't ever be able to reach this, you know, because I, I, I hate that from here. I, you know, I just, I'll, I'll never, I know on, you know, they, they'll leave that like, you know, I'm really the good, but I just, I know I'm never going to be able to be this. Why not? You know, I, I can say right now, you're definitely not with, with that thought process because you're always going to create obstacles or reasons not to get there because then the closer you get there, the more real it comes and the more real it comes, the, the closer you are to touching it and the closer you are to touching it. Now you're at that, that kind of precipice of like, am I going to get burned? <laughs> and are all my fears and like negative thoughts and, and negative self-talk, are they all about to come true? Or am I going to figure out like that I've always been capable of something just, you know, that I never thought. Yeah. And so, so, so that, that pressure increases. And I think it's, it's as we stay away as we tend to, we don't like pressure. Again, we like being comfortable, you know. And so I think it's it's a really hard balance to go. But again, as athletes, that that is that is what we're doing this for. We don't get paid for it, you know. And so to 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 daily flog ourselves for not meeting an expectation or for or just cementing the negative self talk, like it's it's 100% counterproductive. And and I'd argue that the physical the physical benefits you might get from from exercising and from training and from doing these races is totally wiped out by the continuous mental and emotional flogging that you put upon yourself or the cementing of negative self-talk and it's neither of them are worth it if that's where we're going to end up when we're done yeah the sad part is that that flogging that becomes the comfort zone in that weird twisted way you know what i mean like it it's like a bad relationship or whatever. It just it's it's not good. You know it. There's something weird. It's eating at you. It's going on and on and on. But it still feels more comfortable, uh, just because it's familiar and all that sort of thing. I'll tell you a lie I told myself seven years ago, and I told myself this lie for about forty five, forty six years. I can't run. <laughs> you know? Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I just can't do it. I've tried. I've tried. I mean, I tried while I was in the best shape of my life in college. I used to, you know, try and go run with some of the people around. Yeah, we're going for a few mile run. You want to go? Yeah. And I'd get to about maybe a mile. Mm-hmm. And I was in, at you know, college athletic shape. Hockey, you know, played baseball. I played lacrosse. And I just couldn't believe for about 46 years that I could actually run more than a couple miles. Mm-hmm. It took me forever I mean, think about <laughs> there's the food. It's right on time, man. <laughs> I'm gonna just let it go. Somebody That's part of the, it to the C26 hotline. Hello. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's probably a robo call. That's the weird part. Man. I should answer that and get him on. Here. It probably is. Yeah, we can hang him online and and have fun with these telemarketers. Mm, yeah. So, um, but anyway, so, and clearly, that's not the case. Well, it. it <laughs> It doesn't have to be the case, um, and I think I think the a good exercise for everyone to do generally is just to say, you know, a why do I think this, and do I really truly believe it's true, or just have that kind of like accepted accepted it without challenging it, and and again, people don't like to do that because that's not how we usually like to work. Like you know, I would. You know, we don't talk about religion and politics just because that's not our thing. But, you know, I, I, I fully believe that most people, I would probably say 90% of people, have the exact same religious beliefs and the exact same political opinions or stances that their parents do. Mm-hmm. And their parents 
coincidentally, have that exact same belief with their parents and so on and so on and so like we yeah, it's so we just, environmental man yeah it is and so you you just believe it and you're like wait a minute why do i believe this again and but then you're like ah it's just easier to it's easier to and i but totally 100 percent believe this when it comes to training as well is that it's so much easier to accept it than to challenge it because once you once you begin to challenge it, then you challenge. Then again, like I said, like you start to challenge everything, and uncertainty. And because like, I mean, t- triathletes are like the the quintessential type A control freaks, up to the point to where many of them like to control their lack of progress or their or being cemented and believing that they can't. They would just rather control it then throw that to the wind and totally erase those thoughts or totally be a blank slate or let another person have control or follow a training plan or hire a coach. They would just, they they don't want that. They would rather own their own mediocrity or acceptance in their negative thought process or their own unproven story, but one that they've written than they would risk figuring out something else because it would be uncomfortable and then they wouldn't know you know and and i think that's it's like you said about relationships it's like the same person like i'm just not a relationship person i'm just saying and so they convince themselves that they're just never going to be in a relationship and so what happens oh coincidentally never in a relationship yep. because they never go through that like uncomfortable part of like putting yourself out there and just seeing what's possible um because we like to own it that we know ourselves and then what happens is, is when you when you find when you find out that you're not, then everything else is it's 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 emotional for people. It's emotional for athletes, and and I we I deal with it all the time when in in and, and usually in, in good ways. And it's like I just I never thought that I would be able to do this. And they like they do these like even like smaller races where they an athlete that has always been convinced I think that she was like never going to be fast. You know, and I think again, we talk about this too, like fast and slow are so such relative terms. Yeah. <laughs> like you you could ask one hundred people and nobody would probably have the same you know, version of fast, like down to the down to the pace. You know what I mean? Like they would all have something different. Mm-hmm. And so her, she's always told herself that that this version of fast is is totally different. And or that she could never be it. And uh, she had this race on Sunday, and it was just, I think, something like very, very, you know, small in, in terms of like a magnitude of a long race. And she was just burst into tears when she was done mm-hmm. because it was it was another like realization of like a not only am I, um, you know, not only am I not who I thought I was, I'm not done becoming who I'm going to be. Yeah, that is huge. Because in, You're and like, that's, whoa, that just opens up a whole door. Exactly, exactly. But but that, oh, but again, opening that door is scary, you know. And and I think that's why athletes don't like to do it because then you're like, oh my god, what? What's like? It's like people are not afraid to get better, but they're they're afraid to to dive into that that realm of training and pushing themselves or having someone push them because it's it, it's not comfortable and they don't have as much control, but. Um, like to the same extent, the same athlete the day before, when I first started working with her, she started to sign up for races. She said, I'm not a hill climber. I'm not a hill climber. I'm a not a hill climber. What should I do? I said, well, let's just do Lake Placid 70.3 with just, like, <laughs> huge hills. And so the day before this race, she commented in Training Peaks and she said, the headwind was a bitch the entire ride. The head uh, uh, that I can't control, but, but oh well. Best part of the day, being told by three complete strangers that I'm a strong climber. Wow. Something I never thought I would hear. So thrilled with how far I've come, and like, I, I don't, I don't think athletes, I, well, not, I don't think all athletes. Some do. And she obviously is um, with her excessive emoji use in this comment, but it, I think not, not all, not all athletes. I think uh, athletes miss that. I think in the, in the sport that we're in with how much we've 
how much weight we've put behind quote unquote performance mm-hmm. and the metrics associated with those things, we miss the mental and emotional benchmarks or breakthroughs that have infinite like have infinite effect on the rest of our lives versus a digital result in athletics <laughs> you know that's going to be archived that no one's going to care about and i think we missed the boat on that so many times when it comes to pushing ourselves because yes was the time great that this athlete had the, the next day absolutely but it's it's it wasn't a okay we're done it's more of a okay here we keep going <laughs> you know and it's just like and so that's what makes it exciting is that it's not a dead end it's not a finite measurement or or metric or data point that says i'm here or i've arrived it's just another uh, another plot on the course of where i'm trying to go and that you know what for the first time i have no earthly idea where that's going to take me Mm -hmm. or how much better or faster or stronger or more resilient or more fit i'm going to be compared to the person that i was or i thought i was two years ago like, can you imagine having that kind of an excitement when you went up to like, like, and yes, you're not going to feel like that every day. Like, don't get me wrong. Not every day is going to be some euphoric, like training, you know, experience to where you're going to realize that everything is, was worth it. And you're going to start seeing things in slow motion, like the matrix. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, oh, man. when you have these days, that's like the unknown is and that's like the the root of what people say by just diving in and expecting something out of the process is that when you love it and you start to and again as a process has to yield results and if it doesn't it needs a change but that you like getting those moments is what it's all about and i think that's that should always be the focus but again it is really 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 scary for a lot of people yeah for sure. I mean, let's triathlon's hard, man. Like, and when you have that, maybe not that moment, but like the the shorter race you were talking about that the athlete was super happy with, and it's great to look back on that and be happy. But then you kind of look ahead and you're like, man, well, if I keep going, this isn't necessarily going to get any easier. But a, I think that's a good thing a lot of times. But b, I think it can get easier, and I think that's the mm-hmm. point we try to try to make a lot in in so many ways is that you can get to points where this actually feels good you know i mean you're you're gonna go out and do races and it's gonna be hard and it's gonna be but the amazing thing is when you can get done with an iron man the next day and actually feel good you know you're a little sore you're sore you're you're hurting but what a feeling man you know it's like and I understand why that can be scary because I've gone through it and there's been, I've quit triathlon six times and it's all been on the marathon on the Ironman loop, <laughs> <laughs> you know, 12 miles in or 15 miles in. It's like, why? This is it. I'm done. And then, you know, you get through it, but it's that hard stuff that makes life worth living. I think, I think we just have to push ourselves in these situations. And that doesn't always mean like be continually exhausted or whatever, but like you, you live your life in a way where once in a while you push your limits and it really feels gratifying and figure it out. Yeah. You know, and and I I think like that's the, that's the biggest thing is like, because we listen, we live in a world now where we expect something in return immediately all the time, no matter what we do. Yeah. And we got to give it a rating. We got to give it a like. We got to take a picture of it. We got to post it. We got to get likes in return. We got to do this. Like we, it's like, how many things have you done lately where you didn't expect an immediate return? That you just did it because you wanted to, or whether it was uncomfortable or not. And and that same thing is is with training. Is like doing things where you don't feel like you're going to get an immediate return. It's like it's and a lot of athletes do this when they don't feel like like doing any kind of cross training or different sports. It's like, oh, that's not going to apply directly to how I'm going to benefit. Well, if it keeps you sane, then keep at it. You know, but there's there's so many things you can even do within swim, bike, run to challenge yourself and to push yourself in a responsible way that also in line falls within 
the parameters of what's probably best for you training wise, but that you might not see like an immediate, um, you know, an immediate return that satisfies you. But I guess in, in turn, like it also was like, what is your, de- what is your definition of satisfaction? Yeah. You know, is, and, and I think, I think a lot of people are totally confused about satisfaction is it, and that meeting an expectation is rarely a satisfaction because if the only other option is disappointment, then I would argue that that's not really satisfaction because you're, it's either you're meeting an expectation, which is just, see, I told you, uh, or I, or I, I very well should do this. You're just meeting the expectation and you've got it versus if you don't make it, it's a failure uh, where satisfaction can come from so many things that have nothing to do with pass or fail. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's about how you are enriched and how you are filled up and what keeps you going and what keeps you happy. And that's where satisfaction comes from. It's not, you know, it's in most oftentimes it's, it's a, a process, not oftentimes, but it can be a process oriented step by step thing that you do or an experience that gives you or allows you to gain satisfaction versus, Oh, I'm satisfied. You know, and um, with with this specific result, but in ten seconds later, you might not be satisfied. Like you know, we talked about it at probably ten podcasts ago when I you know I said I'll challenge you to, you know, go out for your runs and then come back and comment on how you feel about them before you look at the data. Mm-hmm. And so an athlete would come back and, and have a you know wonderful weather, running in nature, and come back and write, oh, that was such a rejuvenating, you know, run that was so satisfying and I enjoyed it enough. It felt good satisfied satisfaction but if they looked at their watch before that they wrote those comments out and they saw a number they didn't expect or that didn't meet their their uh you know plan for the day it would immediately alter that level of satisfaction or a lot for a lot of athletes just totally erase it and it's like the experience never happened because ah oh, well i thought this was a good run but I didn't do X, Y, and Z. I'm like, oh, mm, mm, okay. Like, how many different lists do you need to be satisfied? Yeah. You know, it's like, or, yeah. or, or, or are you ever satisfied? Yeah. And we also fall in the trap of the, the, letting that satisfaction scale be, you know, anchored in comparisons to other people. And mm. mm-hmm. that's a huge one. You know, I, as I just mentioned, the Ironman Marathon, and there's always, you know, a handful of guys. And I'm, I do all right. But there's a handful of guys on that run every year in my age group, 50 plus area, that towards the end of the run, they kind of just run by me, you know, and they're uh, looking strong. And I'm like, why am I not? And then I never, that instant gratification thing, right? I don't, in that moment, realize that that probably took them 10 or 20 years (laughs) Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? They haven't. They didn't just start running to be like getting done with an Ironman and not even really limping. You know, some of those guys that get done and they're just kind of like, you know, they're tired, but they're not beat up. You know, and those are the things. And then I start. Well, why can't I? It's you get caught in that trap of like finding your satisfaction based on other people measures, and that's a trap, man. You just have to find your own way and find that comfort zone and find your bliss sort of in your own. And we, we had a podcast, you know, train to the shape you're in and find mm-hmm. your bliss right there. You know, you can't I mean, be something can you, you're not today. I mean, and can you imagine how like, this is just, this is kind of a sidebar, but how many athletes at the elitist world-class level have some of them have ruined their psyches believing that they were never going to be good enough only to find out that the people that were quote unquote better than them were doped up to the gills. Oh yeah. That, that is a sidebar, you know, and that's yeah. definitely a topic for a different day when it comes to standards and like, but, but, but I, I've seen them have conversations online and read articles like that. They have those conversations with when they go into train, they think I have to be able to do this, I have to be able to do this and this and this and meet this time threshold as my expectation. Obviously, their expectations are totally different than the age group athlete, but it, it's it's still the 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 same question, same answer about the same topic. It's just you know in a different category. Is that they see so and so running a an, an X number marathon? They're like I can, I can never do that. Like or or 
that is now the only benchmark, and if I don't reach it, it's failure. Yeah, and then they true. don't get it, and then years later they find out that that person was doped up to the gills. The only reason that those numbers seemed like they were the bar were because they were they were just they were just bull. You know, they were false. And then like I judged myself or my my athletic ability or my commitment or my level of of uh, you know eventual success as a elite level athlete based on somebody who cheated the system the entire time. Yeah, well, and, man. And then that's just a magnified version of of again what we see as age groupers when you start to compare yourself to other people. Because I think what athletes we you, it's, listen like you don't see the whole story. You don't see. He, and yeah, are there athletes that are, like listen? There's one best. There's one best. <laughs> there's one best athlete on the planet, and there's one worst athlete on the planet. The rest of us, we fall in the middle. Uh, and the fact is, is that yes, yeah, so there are going to be people better than you and faster than you. Absolutely, there always is. Uh, again, unless you're first or last. And I think we oftentimes forget, like, what what does their life look like, and are they even happy with it? Because I would argue, coming from experience. And working with some athletes and seeing athletes and talking to athletes is that they might be a little bit faster than you, but the amount of things that they're sacrificing in their life or the amount of disgust and disdain or the level of of non-acceptance they have for what they're truly accomplishing is zero because they're chasing it so hard. That's how they are fulfilled versus the person who might be 20 minutes slower but it is love and life and having so much fun. You tell me who the better quote unquote performer is in this hobby of a sport that we take up and we spend money on, you know, who, who, who really is getting the most out of it? Is it the person who's 20 minutes faster and isolates themselves and obsess and never, never has a cupcake, never has a cheat day, never goes to sporting events, skips out on their, on their kids' soccer games and does all these other different things. That's totally obsessed with numbers and they're never good enough. They're always chasing, or is the person who might be just a little bit slower, but has, you know, the majority of their shit together and is enjoying life and, and doesn't see an issue with skipping a workout to go, you know, watch their kids play a game or to not take their bike and their trainer on vacation or to, you know, obsess and they go out and they're okay doing a group run or a group ride, even if it doesn't mean they're not going to hit their exact workout. Like you tell me who, who's performing better. And I, you know, I think, most of us would say the person who's 20 minutes slower because performance is is a lifestyle and that's where we fall into the category you know if you're listening to this podcast for the most part uh i would say except for like maybe one person if there's even one like performance for us is is how we is how we have it as a life and how we insert it and how it applies to and complements the rest of our life and how we perform in general because if it's not, and it's allowing us to not perform in other areas, and like, what's what's the real give and take? What's the real sacrifice? What's the real uh, result and positive feedback that we get by doing it or not doing it? And I think all these questions are ones that you should always ask yourself, and then challenge yourself to, and to remind yourself, like, yeah, you might really, really, really want that time, just because, <laughs> or but then again, what do you want to trade? Do you want to spend less time with your kids? Mm-hmm. Do you want to, you know, weigh your food twenty four seven and never have a cupcake? Do you, you know, uh, never want to do social things? Like, like, yeah. And of course, can you be successful and still do those things? Yes. And I'm not saying you can't because you one hundred percent can. I'm just saying that that it's you know when it comes down to like we were saying like judging your results and success based on someone else's life, don't just base it on the race clock. You know, or don't just judge it in general based on anyone else. Do it based on yourself, where you where you were, where you are, where you hope you're going, and if you feel like you're doing it right. Mm-hmm. I actually know a guy who, like, I guess I'll call him Athlete A in your example, the one that was weighing food and and you know training nonstop and like no free time, no nothing in their life and. This was maybe three or four, three or four years ago, and they they busted their balls and they were just beat up and whatever. And they ended up getting a Kona slot. I think it was a roll down slot, but um, so he made it to Kona, 
And uh, then he had to go through that again that next year, and he just com had a terrible race out there. And uh, this is like, now that's two or two years ago or more. I don't think he's raced since, but he's been hurt. He's been fatigued. There's all kinds of stuff going on. He's still kind of living the same patterns, but now he can't even race. Mm. You know, it's like, it was like pouring all your eggs in that basket and then then the the whole basket just exploded and now it's like whoa what's left not much going on there but hey let's shift gears and i want to you post that thing i think it was sarah true mm -hmm. is that kind of yeah. what the, the angle you're talking about like that those last few weeks or whatever uh i was gonna go you know i originally was gonna go more in depth than to like the technical aspect and how you would train it with a little more of a number space but you know Oh, as man. we as we usually do, he's got away from us here. <laughs> we got away from us on there, so I will. If if you'll remind me, and I'll try to remind myself to go into the the differences. We'll we'll Let's do that talk on Monday. About with her, her uh, yeah, we'll talk about her tweet. But yet again, uh, on Monday we'll talk about it. Um, I'll remind myself, and hopefully you can remind me too. But on Monday I will uh, dive in, and I'll do it before I even ask Mike about anything he wants to say, <laughs> and I'll just dive right in after the intro and talk about the differences and, and, and intensity and volume distribution and in your training and what these workouts should look like and the ebb and flow and what should change and what shouldn't change when you transition from, you know, what most coaches and athletes would call as a traditional build or base phase into what I would call like your race specific, you know, prep. Um, and it looks different for everybody. And I think people have a different general approach to it um but i'll go through that on monday but yeah we can talk about sarah true's um uh, <laughs> twitter uh or i guess tweet um which was hilarious but so true she's such a great follow um and so honest about everything which is i think what also makes her incredibly likable mm. yeah i don't have it in front of me but uh, uh yeah of course you don't <laughs> You know, sabotage my topic and then tell me you want to talk about something <laughs> yeah this is my life people uh, he's, uh she said a current training phase the white knuckle roller coaster of i'm never going to be race ready and wait am i actually kind of fit uh and that is uh i can totally sympathize with that as an athlete and definitely as a coach because I basically will get those texts on the weekly uh, from now until November since we're in racing season. And, and it, it is, it, it's this, I think again, we talk about, I don't know what you want to talk about. And frankly, at this moment, I don't care anymore. Uh, <laughs> is that, uh, is, you know, we always talk about how fitness should be gradual and kind of sneak up on you versus like the PR workouts. And I think this is the also kind of a, a microcosm of how that, did how that develops that you get fitter and you get fitter and you get fitter and you get fitter and then your so your version of fitness is like ever changing because of how it changes on the day to day and the week to week based on a gradual progression not a one off every four weeks and then you're like ah oh, but I, you know I'm it's a, you're 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 notching it up and you just don't feel like you're notching it up but you are notching it up and then you kind of look back like wait a minute not only am I ready I'm I'm pretty fit mm -hmm. you know and, and if the load is applied correctly so I I thought it was a it was an outstanding, an outstanding tweet and an outstanding comment. Yeah. Well, again, it's just a reminder that pros are human too, and they all go through the same kind of stuff that we go through. And it's just pretty wild to hear her question her fitness and stuff because you can only imagine what she's capable of. But, um, yeah, I guess that would be just a natural thing to do because it is weird how you can – you know, and especially after a workout, you know, you're like, all right, I'm ready, I'm ready. And then you can wake up the next day and you can be like, I feel terrible. I feel like terribly out of shape right now. And then you may start going on a run or something. And even in the beginning, you're kind of like, man, how come I don't feel like I did yesterday at the end of that workout or better? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's sort of like this, this uh, chasm of time between your last workout and your next one. All the mental uh, loops that you jump through and this weird expectation that you actually might just keep continuing from that workout and feel better than that. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a weird thing, you know, and especially because we work out so much and sometimes two a days and 
And but it's it's gradual, and you shouldn't fe- you shouldn't recognize it. Right. Yeah. But you know, it, you know, I guess your your body shouldn't recognize it in in the in the um in the shape of being crushed or feeling just torched. Like I had this exact text conversation with an athlete earlier who had like a really really great one. He's like, ah, I commented on this before. Look at that. How did it fe- how did it feel? And I said, well, this is probably one of, if not the best run that you've had since we started working together which was in january and he was like really he was like i don't it didn't feel like a great run because again like when we when we talk about or think about what are what are our great runs you know people always saying oh well you know it's me being just totally shelled you know and like that i just i empty the tank and so like to give an example january 22nd he ran at 8 30 pace for 50 minutes and his average heart rate was 151. And so I've been training a few months, and he's been on a just absolute tear as far as consistency. And today, or yesterday, he ran for an hour at a pace of 739 with the same exact average heart rate of 151. And so I said, you know, great, that's a great, it's a really great run. I said, and he was like, oh, you know, like I said, he's like, I didn't really think it was, uh, you know, think it was, you know, that great of a, you know that great of a run and i said you know it's it's how they're supposed to be they're supposed to be fast they're supposed to feel fast and efficient and that's how, that's kind of where you that's like that happy medium those two those two ingredients fast and efficient is kind of what make you feel effortless you know but they're not supposed to feel crushing and you know and i said that's that's also in the midst of like a huge past two or three weeks of, of volume where he's been running over 30 miles a week for the first time ever and you know, consistently week to week to week to week to week, and he never ran one thirty mile last week ever, or last year before we started working together. And so, I just think that's the example of really it didn't feel like all that much. And then you look at like what actually the production was, and you're like, whoa, that was kind of great, but it didn't feel or look or have the impact of what you would usually associate this gigantic great experience was just kind of another Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of, I kind of feel like, and I don't really go that hard with power as we talk about a lot, but I kind of feel like that's what happens with people on the bike a lot is like, they'll, they'll literally think they'll literally look at their max power number as the indicator for how great their workout is. And that could only be for like, they just barely hit it. Does that happen? Or Mm -hmm. am I just imagining that? Uh, some people do. They're like, ah, I nailed that minute. And then you're like, but the... You know, I the, peaked I'm, at 1,000 or something. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah like, that was my peak power. I'm like, congratulations. That also <laughs> was like dwarfs in comparison to what... Yeah, that was like you trying to um, avoid getting shot. That was your adrenaline <laughs> yeah. you know, Yeah, spike. I see that a lot on the bike when Try dogs... Try to do that by, they're you know, like, for you know, two peak, minutes. Peak power, dog came to bite me. Yeah, uh, exactly. You know, or, or on the run. Peak heart rate, peak pace when... Uh, approached by two strange men in a minivan, um, but no, I mean it's again, it's it's just uh, those are yeah, those are interesting indicators though to like the potential we have in us maybe. It's oh, I like, to- I one hundred percent agree. You know, when you so, when you remove the when you remove the governor that is your mind and expectations and 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 self prophesied story, like you start to see like all different kinds of, of shades and experiences and levels of training that if you just, if you didn't rip it away, you would, again, you just end up being a Corolla instead of a Corvette. Mm. Let's end it on that one. Okay. Yeah. I mean, unless you have something else you want to railroad this topic and podcast with. Nah, I think I'm going to end it there. I was going to try something cute, but I think that I'm going to wait. <laughs> Try something cute. What? When was the last time we tried something cute? No, <laughs> you're right. Yeah, let's talk about this in our. No, he wasn't even cute. It was just dumb. I just decided oh. I'm not going to say it. All right, good. Then let's let's we say enough dumb things already. We don't need to add one. At the oh, end speaking of, the of which, though, I got to bring this up because oh, I almost got us out of here. Go ahead. Uh, I know you 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 did good there. Um, because I am in in a small town in Wisconsin now and. I've been listening to this. Uh, when I was driving up, I just happened to land on a radio station, and they were talking about. Well, this doesn't matter. They, was, they were talking. They were broadcasting the state basketball tournament, so I listened for a while. But not, during the day, they have music, and then in the morning yesterday, 
they have DJs still, and it's this really small station. I don't know how they do it, but um, the guy was like, let's go over to our, uh, let's bring in our uh, weather person or whatever from Monroe or whatever. And they, it was like they had two separate, you know, stations that were talking. And the guy was, mm-hmm. the guy started talking about candy bars to this weather person. Mm-hmm. And like, oh, we were in Cancun and they had Snickers in the room. They talked for candy bars for like seven minutes. Uh, I, mean, hey, I, I mean, it we was. Can, we can we can relate to that. <laughs> that was my point of this whole thing is that it was oddly fascinating. I mean, it was. I kept like it just kept blowing my mind that he kept going. Well, what what about Twix? You like Twix? And and she was like, Yeah, Twix is pretty good. And then, but Butterfinger's my favorite. And they just kept going on. And I'm like, Is this really on right now? <laughs> and it just reminded me of us. And I think that. You know, sometimes the best ideas start at those little small stations that are just kind of quirky. So maybe we're on the right path with our, uh, with our uh, nonsense sometimes. What is your favorite candy bar? I think, oh, so this, like, if you backed me in a corner and said you could only take one to a desert island or something like that? Yeah, not just one, but, like, that's all you could live off of. Right. I would have to go with Snickers. Ah, that's a good choice. It's just I'd a, go, it's just a I, balanced... Yeah, it's a standard. But then again, you're probably only saying that because their marketing of satisfies the hunger. Uh, um, it might be true. I'm going to go a little off rail here and probably one that I think is one of the most underrated candy bars on the planet. And that is the Fifth Avenue. <laughs> Come on. Do they what? even sell those? Yes. What do, you, do they sell those? They they absolutely sell those. And even the most you know experienced you know, candy bar palette individuals would even appreciate the greatness of the Fifth Avenue. What is that? Some kind of like old school oh my God. candy it's bar like, of the opulence listen, or something? It was, it is the, uh, the Fifth more, Avenue. It's the more dignified version <laughs> okay. of the, of the Bush League Butterfinger. Oh, it is? It's, it's not as much, um, but again, it doesn't need to be. You know, the the Fifth Avenue is more about more about quality the butterfinger is about quantity mm. and so i would encourage you if you're out thin there crust versus thick crust ew that's why well, we're not gonna go there that's a whole different podcast um <laughs> we should do a sidebar yeah we should uh yeah so if you're out there and you're on a road trip or not and you want to get on and you want to take part in the and what is the most underrated candy beer on the planet you can go to fifth avenue and uh, or the gas station grab Fifth Avenue. I will say it's probably gonna be in the bottom shelf. They they don't they don't we don't need to pay for you know great placement on the shelves of these grocery stores. So uh, if you're in the know, you'll get one. It's and like have, a Rolex of the candy bars. Yeah, just saying, have <laughs> one and uh, get I might back do to that today, let brother. Me know, and then let me know how it goes uh, either in the Crushing Iron Facebook page. Or uh, via email, you can let me know your candy bar experience at c26coach at gmail.com. Or if you want to just be the average Joe and go standard Snickers, you can email Mike directly at crushingiron at (laughs) gmail.com. And if you want to know anything else about what we do besides candy bar and basketball chit-chat, you can go to All Things Triathlon, which is everything that we do at crushingiron.com. It's all there. It's all there. And uh, we're going to get off now before we talk about pizza. Yep, we better do that. All right, man. We'll have a separate cast, pizza only. Let's do it. All right, I'm going to go out and get me a Fifth Avenue today. See what the hype is about. Do it. Let me know. All right, brother. I'll talk to you later, man. Amen. Amen.